I start with a question as, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, how should this story tell itself? Because there are different strategies that are available. And what attracted me to Stuart Beatty's screenplay was the notion that it all happens in, in a very short time frame, meaning that it's like the third act of a traditional drama and you're making a whole motion picture about only the third act. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine, mate. Don't worry about it. And one of the big reasons I want to make the film was that we're seeing fractions or fractals. We're seeing a fraction that represents the whole. And only what you need to know is what you're, is what you're seeing. And it doesn't uh, go backward in time or give you exposition about other parts of the life. They don't really talk about themselves that much. So in the beginning, I wanted to enter this scene or enter these activities with kind of a torn edge. Uh, so we just see Vincent in LAX, a plane, we hear a plane land, Vincent's in LAX, he meets somebody who's foreign, and that's all you need to know is that he's foreign, he's got a South London working class accent. This accidental bumping into each other, you realize, if I've done my job correctly, is not really accidental. It's premeditated, and a briefcase has been exchanged. So that whatever it is that Vincent's here to do, you know only the few things you need to know, which is that it, there was a premeditated plan to it, it's secretive, and it involves people from foreign places. And then we enter the domain of Max, but we don't know what it is first. There's abstract pieces of things, and then we realize those abstract pieces of things are in fact cars, and that the cars are cabs, and that there's drivers waiting to go on a shift. And what I'm trying to direct the attention to is that Max is uh, very obsessive about uh, making this environment of the interior of his cab clean and perfect, and that he has a picture that is, has some significance to him because he very carefully mounts it on his visor, and then he closes out chaos, makes chaos go away. In um, putting together the film, uh, again, as the storyteller, the first thing I'm looking for is who are these people? Who is Max? Who is Vincent? Who are these characters? What's their history? Uh, where did Vincent come from? How did Vincent get made into the Vincent? who uh, shows up in L.A. late afternoon on this one day. Uh, where did Max come from? Some of the answers to this that, uh, as, as, as the director that I build in building the characters um, and in working with the actors in pre-production and, and uh, in forming the character of, of Vincent with Tom and, and Max with Jamie uh, had to do with um, their histories, where they came from, uh, I wanted to form characters who were absolute strangers to each other and constituted opposites to each other in every conceivable way that I could because they're about to be thrown together into this cab. One of the big things that appealed to me about uh, this film is to, is to tell a story the way the story tells itself, which is that since we're only in these 10 hours, we're only seeing a small fraction of a whole life. And since we're only in the 10 hours, the challenge is can I design those fractions so that they become glimpses that you kind of sense the person? To do that, one has to invent the history of Vincent, the history of Max, and then choose those details to put into the 10 hours of tonight the way Max dresses or the kind of self-deceptive attitude he has when he talks about a limo company. The film doesn't do what a life experience of these 10 hours also would not do, which is to have exposition or to travel backwards in time via flashbacks or any of those other devices, but instead just to keep us immediate into this present and yet to have a greater degree of knowingness about, uh, about their lives. The other aspect about Vincent's appearance is, again, in, in, in building the character and how to make these two characters be oppositional, what Vincent has chosen to wear it tells us things. I believe that audiences are much brighter than they are aware of. There's a lot of information they take in on a feeling level. Uh, there's a cut to his suit that uh, says perhaps it was custom tailored, but not in Milan or London or New York. In my mind, it was in Kowloon. Uh, the thing about his hair, the scars on his hands, scars on his face. Uh, in effect, he's kind of rough trade in a, in a good suit prematurely gray, kind of a steely aspect to them. Those are design issues that are designed to tell us, tell audience, tell you things about who he is on a feeling level, not on anything that um, is didactic or spoken to you. 
It was tricky to arrive at some of these looks and some of these issues because, uh, and this is also the challenge of the film, it made it very exciting for me to, to do it and to want to do it, which is that um, when you compress the time frame of a narrative and it's down to under two hours and you're just in one locale for one night, it also means there's going to be one suit and one wardrobe change, so everything becomes inordinately important. It's kind of like driving a race car where a small input in steering has a very radical effect. So the slightest change, because it, it's cumulative, becomes a big deal. When you're working on a film during pre-production, you find yourself moving through different neighborhoods as you're looking for your locations. And you oftentimes get glimpses into lives and people's residences. And, um, you know, you see fragments of um, just working folks and their conditions. And sometimes these fragments can speak about a whole life or a whole existence that's not really part of the story, yet it is really part of the environment. And I find that very powerful. And sometimes I'll try to build that into the environment as something that maybe is glimpsed in passing. It may be something that we don't take in except on this kind of a sensory level and so it's a small detail but the idea of these two guys in this room with a line that they run across the room where they hang their six or seven good shirts that they brought up from mexico that was a particularly unique facet of something we saw and so i reproduced it here for myself i have to know exactly what a scene is trying to do and i believe that i should be able to distill that into one simple set of words called the action and uh, in this case is, what is Vincent doing? What does Vincent want? And usually has to be expressed in the infinitive, and it is that Vincent, it is to manage. Vincent needs to manage Max. Why? Oh, no, 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 hold on, man. No, I told you we had other stuff. Now, there's many other layers and many other things that are happening here. Uh, Max has just experienced the dead body. He's never seen this kind of violence before. Uh, if there was an adrenaline rush that kept him functioning in the alley, now that he's driving, the adrenaline's worn off. He's, he's, he's on the precipice of falling into shock or going into a fugue state. I mean it. I mean it. I'm, I'm, I'm not up for this. Okay, hey, hey, hey. You're stressed. Yes, I am. You're stressed. I understand that. You just keep breathing and stay calm. So one of the things he's doing is throwing out some really provocative thoughts that are also part of Vincent's themes, but nevertheless they're being used to provoke Max, and that's keeping Max sharp. Vincent's saying that uh, what difference does it make if one fat guy falls to six billion people on a planet, Max, what are you worried about? We're in the plan B. Still breathing? Now we gotta make the best of it. Improvise, adapt to the environment, Darwin, shit happens, I Ching, whatever, man, we gotta roll with it. I Ching, what are you talking about, man? a man out of the window. I didn't throw him. He fell. But what did he do to you? What? He was giving them a justification and was using everything from social Darwinism to the I Ching to advise Max in a therapeutic way how Max ought to think about the events that have just happened. And Max is confound. He's also, by being confound, he's also preoccupied. And in fact, he is still driving. Because Vincent, from his point of view, has a number of jobs to do. He's got to watch out for, see if they picked up surveillance. And so you'll see him throw looks from time to time out the side of the car. Secondly, he's working on his uh, PC because he has to go to target number two. And number three, he's got to keep Max functioning. 